He's going to preach the word to us tonight. Welcome, Brother Mike Williams, in the name of Jesus. Why don't you stretch your hands out toward the front? Pray the prayer of faith right now, just for 30 seconds. Come on, every voice in the house. Every voice in the house. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph, and you may be seated. <laughs> Let's let that kind of shout fill this house tonight. <laughs> There's strength in it. There's strength in it. You may be seated. Face to face, face to face with his dying father Jacob, Joseph brought his sons Ephraim and Manasseh from between his knees and fell on his face to the earth and watched in horror as the aging patriarch crossed his hands, wittingly the Bible said, and pronounced the greater blessing over the younger boy and with those anointed hands the die was cast. For generations to come. With a sea before them, 600 chariots behind them. And no promise of escape. That newly liberated nation of Israel was certain that they had walked not only into the wilderness but into their graves as well. Until God said, stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. Moses did and they danced dry shod to the other side. Joshua attacked Amalek in the valley of Rephidim, but the battle went sorely until Aaron and Hur held high the hands of Moses, and it was then that God's people prevailed. The men of Israel had gone away when Eleazar, one of David's triumphant of mighty men, defied Philistia and smote them until the sword clave to his hand, and the Lord wrought great victory that day for his people. With his hand, Elisha cast a branch into the briny waters and they were purified with their hands. The priest flayed the sacrifices of the supplicants and Israel's sins were pushed ahead. Mantle in hand, Elijah smote the Jordan, crossed it, was ferried away into heaven in a chariot of fire into the presence of God. Bow and arrow at the ready, a dying prophet put his hands upon the hands of Joash, opened the window eastward, commanded him to shoot, and proclaimed it the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. You go to the Gospels and we find phrases that indicate Jesus stretched forth His hand to heal. That He took a damsel by the hand and delivered her from death. That He blessed and break and multiplied the loaves miraculously in His hand. Indisputably, not a few of God's miraculous works were wrought by His hand. That same scenario continued when His disciples being empowered by the Holy Ghost themselves saw supernatural deliverance with their hands. Lifeless limbs of the lame were strengthened when Peter stretched forth his hands. Supplicants were filled with the Holy Spirit baptism when hands were laid upon them. Anointing for ministry was conferred by the laying on of hands of the presbytery. The Hebrew writer 
validated the process as a stone of doctrinal foundation when he included the laying on of hands with such cardinal truths as repentance and baptism and eternal judgments. I am telling you tonight that a significant number of God's supernatural works would have to be excised from the Holy Scripture if you're going to discount those things done by the agency of human hands. But let me rise tonight to tell you that many of God's most magnificent, many of God's most miraculous, and might I say many of God's most meaningful works on earth in time have been accomplished without hands. Absent any human involvement, absent any obvious earthly agent at all, just the sovereign supernatural manifestation and demonstration of God. When Daniel interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he articulated for him the meaning of the vision that had vexed him. He identified the pieces of that fantastic image that foretold a succession of powers to come. Daniel saw and Daniel said that there would come a stone that would be cut out without hands and that it would break in pieces the iron and the brass and the gold and the silver and the clay. Daniel said it would smite the image. That it would break it. That it would make it like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And that same stone, he said, that smote the image would become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. I'm going to leave prophecy to the prophets, but I'm smart enough to tell you that without hands, our world is going to witness the collapse of every carnal kingdom, the fall of every man-made system is going to finally be accomplished without hands. It will not be by the machinations of men or the prowess of political powers and parties, but without hands it will happen. And I'm rising tonight to say to this because of the times that while I'm happy that God is pleased to work with our hands, I'm looking tonight for that that power and that demonstration and that glory and that miraculous outpouring that is the consequence of God working with us. So attuned are we to the tangible, what we can see, what we can touch, what we can hear to the world of our senses that we're often reticent to accept. We're reticent to embrace the idea that God is working as well apart and aside, above and beyond all of us. May I tell you tonight that He works above and beyond what we can ask or even think. Happily, God is obliged to use us, to use our hands to perform His purpose in the earth. And I say thank God He is. But I want you to know tonight, it's true as well, that not a few of God's works have been done. They are being done. They will continue to be done until He comes without hands. And it's for that sovereign manifestation. It's for that supernatural demonstration that I want to posture myself. I want to posture my family. I want to posture the church over which I've been given charge. I pray God help me to posture us to believe in, to expect, to be ready to receive that bounty and blessing of God that is above what I can ask, that is beyond what I can think. Help me to experience the works of God that are done and the purpose of God that is accomplished without hands. Somebody shouted without hands. Shout without hands. Let me become comfortable with the fact that when we've done what we can, He does what we can't. Let me embrace the idea. 
that beyond what I'm able to ask, beyond what I might attempt to accomplish, beyond what I would ever dare to do, there are works that will be done. There are demonstrations that will be accomplished without hands. I've got a God who's working even while I'm waiting. I've got a God who's moving when I'm standing still. I serve a God who can be heard where my voice will never go. I have a God who can be felt where I cannot reach. Zechariah told the truth when he said this is the word of the Lord. It's not by might nor yet by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. I'm serving a God who has found of them who sought Him not who has manifest to them who ask not after Him. You make of it what you will but I'm telling you I'm glad to have a Savior who's got something going on besides what I'm doing. I thank God for those things that happen as a consequence of our efforts but I thank God more for what happens without hands. Without hands. Without hands. Two decades and twenty years Jabin king of Canaan kept Israel cowering in the caves and clefts of the rock in the valley of Jezreel the plains of Esdralon he kept them there with 900 iron chariots that had staves of steel protruding from the wheel hubs and the mountain shook every time Sisera drove his chariots through the plain across the floor of that valley he was frightening and intimidating every Hebrew who dared even imagine himself to be free and Jabin kept them there until somebody decided that it was enough until Deborah took the time to peruse the past and the pages of victories before and decided that her destiny didn't have to be held hostage to just what could be done with human hands. She found out that God had faced and God had fought and God had finished off chariots before at the Exodus and realized there was no reason He couldn't do it now. She summoned Barak from the north. She convinced those cowering people to come out of their caves. She assembled that unarmed, motley band of millions in the valley of Jezreel and they waited. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that Barak must have come by and said, Deborah, what now? We've got 900 steel chariots headed our way. The dust is rising in the distance. Jezreel is starting to rumble. There's not a sword. There's not a spear. There's not a pruning hook among us or Abraham's seed. But we're unarmed and we're standing in the way of 900 chariots. They were powerless to save themselves. If it was going to happen, it was going to happen without hands. What do we do now? Look into Deborah's song. She said the stars... In their courses, they fought against Sisera. Sisera didn't know it, but he never had a chance. He said they fought from heaven and the river Kishon, that ancient river, it swept them all away. There were stars that fought. There were rivers that were fought. God sent a hailstorm, flooded the old dried up riverbed of Kishon. He made a mud hole out of the valley and pulled the wheels off of Sisera's chariots. He did it. He delivered his people. And he did it without hands. And I'm rising to tell somebody at the close of the times, 2002, that our God is able to do above and beyond what we can ask to think. Thank God for what happens at the end of our hands. But thank God more for what happens among us without hands. Come on, put your hands together and shout. Midianites were savage. They practiced a scorched earth policy. They violated the women. They poisoned the wells. They scarred the land. Little wonder Gideon was hiding behind a wine press, threshing wheat, trying to protect it from the prying eyes of his enemy. When suddenly God summons an angel, gives him a message for Gideon, and God tells that angel, you treat Gideon with respect because in three weeks he's going to wipe out the world's greatest war machine. And he's going to do it without hands. 
two fleeces one broken down altar later Gideon finds himself with an army of 32,000 but before he can start marching it's down to 10,000 he can't get turned around good he has only 300 hallelujah hallelujah and God sends him down into the enemy's camp and lets him eavesdrop on their dreams and Gideon discovers that there's more going on than he knows about Come on, somebody hear me. There's something going on above and beyond what we're asking and what we're thinking. There's an eternal purpose that's unfolding over the hearts and heads of this united Pentecostal church that's bigger than your vision, that's greater than your vision. You hear me? I'm telling you, God has an eternal purpose that's unfolding in this earth. There's something bigger here than we know. Unwittingly, some soldier turns to his buddy in the tent and he said, I had a dream last night. Yeah, what's that? He said, I saw a barley cake rolling down a mountain. It came into our camp and wiped us out. And before Gideon can even creep away from the tent, another pagan looks at the friends and he says, it's nothing more than the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And Gideon looks in his hand and he don't even have a sword. But there's something going on without hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before the next dawn breaks, he breaks the pitchers. He blows the trumpet. He lets his light shine. And the Midianites, they turn one upon the other. They slaughter themselves. And God gives Gideon a victory without hands. Listen here. Come on now. Don't go out of here and say, I said something I didn't say. We can't park our Bibles. We've got to continue to fast and to pray and to give and to go but you're looking at one man that believes that there's something going on in the spirit that there's something going on in the kingdom there's something going on in us about us around us above us that's without hand I happen to believe this is bigger than us I happen to believe that there are things transpiring in the world of the spirit that are greater than we can ever imagine Some missionary here needs to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not just you and your family pitted against the evil of that land to which you've been called and above and beyond what you will ever do. There's also what God's going to do without hands. Why don't you go back over there expecting it? Some dear home missionary who has looked at your inadequate facility, your insufficient finances, your infant congregation, you've concluded that your war is unwinnable. Don't raise the white flag just yet. Don't toss in the towel just yet. When you've done all that you can do, just stand still and see what He will do without hands. I wish you'd shouted without hands. We need to know that beyond what we ask, beyond what we think, beyond what we dare to do, that God is at work in us and for us and about us. He's at work in men, in ministries, in movements, and even in mighty nations. He works to will and to do. Listen to what Isaiah said. He said, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. Here's your man, Sister Mang, and Isaiah. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. See, God's in business too. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? He said, the Lord has purposed, and nobody can disannul it. And He has stretched out His hand, and who can turn it back? Who shall turn it back? What shall one then answer? The messengers of the nation. He said, what are you going to tell? The people that come asking what's going on. And he answered his rhetorical question. He said, say that the Lord hath founded Zion and His people shall trust in it. God's purpose is going to find its fulfillment both within and without the walls of our houses of worship. He will perform and He will perfect His purpose. He will do His work among men. 
He said, before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. I even I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. He said, I'm the first and I'm the last. And beside me there is no God. He said, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. I'm the Lord that maketh all things. That stretcheth forth the heavens alone. That spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He said, I'm God and there is none else. I'm God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. There's no doubt what's going to happen. Hallelujah. And from ancient times, things that were not yet done. He says, I will do all my pleasure and my counsel shall stand. May I tell you, apostolics, the purpose of God is going to find its fulfillment in the earth beyond what you and I may do. God is working without hell. When the communists were driving Chiang Kai-shek and his Nationalist Republic Army off the mainland of China in the 40s, they drove him and his soldiers into the sea. What you may not know is that Chiang Kai-shek was a professing Christian. In the late 20s, about 1926, he had married a believer in Jesus Christ and converted himself to Christianity. And so the world watched with bated breath and believers prayed as he fought so to survive against that atheistic communistic regime. He retreated toward the sea. He confiscated every floating craft that he could find and escape to the island of Taiwan. And immediately Chiang Kai-shek had his being and built defenses and they waited anticipating the inevitable invasion of the communists and those communists would have invaded and they would have wiped out Chiang Kai-shek and they would have strangled every vestige of belief in Jesus Christ save for one thing in preparation for their amphibious assault those communists trained in the inland lakes at the ocean's edge. And in those lakes there were microbes. And those microbes got in their bodies and made them deathly ill. And dysentery set in. And they were too weak to walk, much less fight. And so they turned back. And the miracle that is Taiwan transpired without hands above and beyond what any man could do. And if that was the end of the story, it would be enough moot witness to the might of God. But there's more because you and I have lived long enough to see the end of the matter. Hallelujah. That communist regime, though they failed to snuff out the light of belief in Jesus Christ, they succeeded veritably in choking to death Buddhism and Shintoism on the mainland of China. And unwittingly, they left a spiritual vacuum. And now a generation has risen that's hungering for the supernatural and that's wanting to be touched by another world. Brother Schism told me just two days ago that 30,000 people a day are being filled with the Holy Ghost on the mainland of China. And many of them are oneness apostolics. I'm telling you, it's the consequence of a sovereign supernatural intervention. It's not the work of a movement. It's not the work of a man. It's above. It's beyond what anyone could orchestrate. It's happening. And it's happening without hell. Sometime in the spring of 97, the hail bop comet came streaking through our dark sky. And with it, all manner of mysteries were unleashed. And even in sophisticated America, the end for the celestial and the supernatural became painfully obvious. And something like 39 educated high-tech Asians prepared. They prepared to be picked up by a spaceship that they were convinced was in the tail of the comet hail bop. And their suicides, dozens of them, holed up in a San Diego mansion. Their suicides became known as Heaven's Gate, which sadly, I'm sure they discovered it wasn't. But suffice it to say, 
that yours and mine is a generation that's grasping, that's trying to reach, that's trying to get a grip on another world that's tailor-made for what we have to offer if we will but see it. Hebrews 12 reveals to us that both in the early church and at the end, God's people may not often understand what's present when we come into His presence and when we come into this place. He said, you are not come. The Hebrew writer thundered under the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire under blackness and darkness and tempest. He said, you're not come under the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Here in this house, we're not trafficking in the midst of types and shadows. He said, but when you come together, you come under the city of the living God to the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. You've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all and the spirits of just men made perfect. My brothers and sisters, there is more here than meets the eye. There's more going on in this house than you and I may know. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And the holy writer said, See that ye refuse Him not. And fascinating imagery of this forever settled book. We're being told that for the most part, we have no idea where we are when we are here. That the power and the presence and the potential for the supernatural that's generated by our oneness and our worship is beyond the pale of our understanding. I'm telling you that around us, even now, there are angels and there are miracles and there are ministering spirits. And wherever we are, there's an invisible world of wonder and of power. It's not being held in abeyance for somebody else, somewhere else. It's waiting for us to apprehend it. I pray God help us to believe it. Help us to expect it. Help us to embrace it. Help us to see it. Help us to seize it. That there's more going on in this kingdom than what we can do with our hands. That God Almighty is at work without hands. The Bible said as it is written I have not seen nor heard neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. If you're going to preach on heaven, take you another text. That's not talking about heaven. Because the next verse says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Brothers and sisters, it's here. It's here right now. If we'll just see it. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. Jesus Christ took His nearest and dearest, His most devoted disciples to the summit of a mountain. He wanted them to see while He was transfigured. His garment was glistering white. There was a resurrected dead man standing on either side. He was enveloped in a cloud. A voice from heaven declared His identity. And through it all, they were asleep. For a while, they saw nothing. They heard nothing. They experienced nothing. But believe me, it wasn't because there was nothing there. Mark wrote it this way. He said, when they awoke. Had nothing to do with what God was doing. It had everything to do with what they were doing. He said, when they awoke, they saw His glory. I don't know how to say this any more simply than I am. But I am one who believes that above and beyond what I can ask or think, transcending what I would ever dare to do, that without hands, the Holy Spirit of the God of heaven is moving, is working, hallelujah, is manifesting, is demonstrating, is doing things in this earth. I'm praying God help me to wake up to what's going on. Somebody shout without hands. My generation grew up unable to forget the taunting statement of Nikita Khrushchev to America when he said we'll bury you alive no idle threat. The world was postured for war. Civil defense signs were on every public building. At my YMCA, at my school, on the library. Civil defense signs. After a generation of angst, 
None of us will ever forget our American president having the courage to call it what it was. He said it was an evil empire. But how stunned was our world when without warning, without a shot ever being fired, when college kids in Berlin was scrambling across the Berlin Wall that was crumbling and communism, at least as we know it, collapsed almost in a day. Incredibly, it was a scenario that the most optimistic people in society could never have imagined. The walls went down, the borders came open, and overnight there were men with a mission in the parks and squares of Russia, and they were sharing the gospel. And after that long night of darkness, the door of opportunity and evangelism was instantly opened, and it happened without hands. And we need to know that He can work, that beneath the surface of circumstances, that often we ourselves do not understand that God Almighty is at work. Hallelujah. In the 50s, in an effort to get help for the persecution of our people in Colombia, specifically in South America, Brother Urshan appealed to the United, UN Secretary General. You thought, I asked him just a fortnight ago about it again. And when he talked to you thought about the persecution of Pentecostals in Colombia, the UN Secretary General said to him that he believed that the Pentecostal revival in Colombia was responsible for saving that nation from communism. Now, I know some of us live in real tiny little worlds, but this stuff happening without hands. But that revival that that unbeliever was aware of and said that he thought had saved that nation from communism was largely a result of a 16-year-old girl who had come out of the mountains and had gone to Cali to go to school. And while she was in Cali, she was converted to the apostolic way. When her schooling was finished, notwithstanding the protestations of those that were around her that did not want her to go back to the violence and the uncertainty of the mountains, she went anyway and instantly began to witness and to tell everything that God had done for her consequence of her witness was revival broke out in that village and revival so significant that the main business in the village which was a bar the, no pun intended but his business dried up he was the most he was the most powerful personality in that village and so one night he packed his pistol and he headed down toward the Pentecostal because he was going to put a stop to this. I think the way the old song said it was something got a hold of me. That old pistol packing bartender hit that Pentecostal revival and he went there to shut it down. But while he was there, somebody got a hold of him. He got baptized in Jesus. Now, listen, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He became the general superintendent of an apostolic organization in the nation of Colombia. A revival that attracted the attention of the diplomats of the United Nations. I don't know how you think. I don't know what your purpose is. But I thank God that there's stuff going on without hands that I have nothing to do with. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to preach. I'm going to give. I'm going to go. But I'm going to get up on my feet and thank God that there's a God in heaven that is working above and beyond what I can ask or think. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, 
You walk out of this building and you leave this electric atmosphere and the faith that's generated in your spirit and you find yourself surrounded by all the inadequacies of a situation that defy description and you think, great God Almighty, there's no way for me to get from A to Z. I want you to stop and I want you to step back and I want you to contemplate that everything that's going to happen in your church, in your ministry, in your mission field, or wherever is not going to be something that happens by the work of your hands but there's some things that God is going to do that have nothing to do with what you can accomplish He's just going to do some stuff without it you are going to get that property they are going to give you that loan that family is coming that preacher will be baptized that wall will come down. That door will open. It's not going to happen because you make it happen. It's going to happen without hands. Without hands. Remain standing Monday night in your house. There was a tongues and interpretation. And the Holy Spirit said that there is something going on. Something going on that you don't have nothing to do with. You don't know anything about. He said, I got stuff happening that I hadn't checked with you about. You heard your general superintendent stand in this pulpit today and said there is something sovereign that is unfolding that's going to be beyond our wildest imaginings. When God got ready to move His millions out of Egypt, Egypt was the mistress of nations, the superior military might of the earth. They had spent four centuries in slavery and their spirits had been suffocated. Their wheels had been broken. And so, I'd be tempted to ask God, how are you going to get them out? And God said, well, I think I'm going to use some frogs. And some flies and some locusts and some lice and some murane and a little darkness and he said when I get finished then I'm going to have to ask permission to leave Pharaoh's going to run them out of town and he said when they go they're going to go rich because they're going to borrow everything they can carry. They're going to go well because I'm going to miraculously heal them. And the psalmist David said, there was not a feeble one among them. And God did it without hand. Come on, somebody. When you look at your talents, your ability, your gifts, your resources, and you say, how? I'm standing on the line and saying, I'll tell you how. It's going to happen without hands. <laughs> I want to take a trip to the prophet's porch. And let the scales fall from my eyes. And instead of tendering my resignation, because I've seen the glimmering swords of the Syrians in the mountains, I want God to open my eyes and let me see that those hills are filled with the horsemen of heaven and the chariots thereof. There's some things that God just does without hand. I'll leave you with this verse. Next time you quote Isaiah 9 and 6, keep going. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, and Counselor, and the Mighty God, and the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace. Come on, just 
Let's hold on. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Let me tell you something. Nobody's going to stop this. I wish somebody would shout nobody. No government, not finances. Not collapsing economy. Not war. Not social trend. Not religious apostasy. Nothing is going to stop The next verse says, The seal of the Lord, the seal of the Lord will perform this. Isaiah said, God's going to make it happen. He said, If you get to feeling cool, he said, Just back them down, baby, because God is going to make this happen. He said, God is going to bring this to pass. I'm rising to tell somebody that in your church, in your ministry, in your family, on your mission field, wherever, whatever it is for which you care, I'm coming to say that God is going to bring it to pass and God is going to perform it. And you don't have to rely simply on what can happen at the end of your hand, but you can trust and you can have confidence in the fact that God's purpose will be performed Hallelujah, that his hand has been stretched out and it cannot be. Somebody shout, Yes! Come on together, let's say it with our hands. With our hands. With our hands. I'll tell you this, and I go. Sunday passed. About 150 people in our church, under Debbie's direction, put on a fantastic, dramatic depiction of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa. In that weekend, a thousand visitors came into our church. Fifty-four people were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. But more powerfully than even all of that. And there were some wonderful things that happened. She hired a newspaper reporter from Merritt Island a part-time actor to work with some of the actors. He came on Saturday night and he got baptized in Jesus' name and got the Holy Ghost. And his mother. But what moved me most, Brother Hal, were those four deaf mutes. Four deaf mutes who never heard anybody's voice inflection. Who never felt the beast beat of the bass drum. Who never heard that tight little band. Who never heard one melodious voice of a choir. Here was those four deaf mutes who had not the benefit of all of the sound and the energy and that inspiration that made us laugh and made us weep. But I watched four deaf mutes stand to their feet on the front row of that church and speak with other tongues as the Spirit began to give them the utterance because there's some things that happen that are just without it. Without hand. Without hand. Hey, I don't know what it is you're hoping and praying and believing for, but I wish you'd raise your hand right now and say, God, I can't make it happen, but I'm confident that you can. Without hand.